Hi everyone, I'm uh, Stephen Goldfeder, and I'm going to talk today about uh, something I've talked about uh, here previously at SESC and or CESC, and uh, uh, talked about it a bunch, but presenting some announcing some new results today, which I'm really excited about. And uh, uh, I'll try to keep the talk at a pretty high level, so, sort of saying, "Hey, what are threshold signatures? What's different about the, what I'm telling you about today, and how can you use this in your protocols?" Uh, the paper will be available uh, shortly, and you'll get all the uh, dirty technical details on that today, but hopefully you'll take something out of today and saying, hey, how can I incorporate this into my protocols? This is joint work with Rosario Gennaro at uh, City College. So uh, digital signatures authorize transactions in, uh, in cryptocurrencies. And what that means is when Alice wants to pay Bob, uh, all she has to do is Bob's not involved, Alice goes ahead and signs something. And that signature, she broadcasts that to the network and poof, Bob gets money. And the thing is, uh, and this is something which um, is by now pretty well known, is that, well, Alice's key there is uh, a single point of failure. If you manage to steal Alice's key or Alice loses her key, then she sort of just loses all of her money. And uh, this is something we've actually seen many, many times. We all know someone who's lost a whole lot of money in Bitcoin. They were trying to like secure it or something and had some VM password hooked together and they lost all that money. So this is something we see all the time and it's a really, really big problem. And I think personally, it's one of the biggest problems to uh, adoption in cryptocurrencies is key custody. How can I ask my grandmother to uh, hold her keys when I can't even ho hold my keys securely? And how can I expect widespread adoption? So uh, the, the basic problem is, uh, well, the basic solution to a problem is, okay, so let's not store our keys on, on, a sing on a single device. Let's avoid this single point of failure, and we'll go ahead and we'll split our key. We'll say this address is not protected by a key, it's protected by multiple keys. Some people like to use the word uh, key list, or there's no single key that, that authorizes a transaction. And the idea is if, you, if one of your devices is compromised or your phone falls in a puddle and you lose it, you don't just lose access to your, to your Bitcoin or your Ether or whatever currency uh, uh, is your favorite. You uh, can still recover from that. And if someone steals your device, they can't just gain access to all of your life savings. And of course, this is the, not a new idea. Bitcoin itself, from the relatively early days, incorporated a multi-signature feature, which is in, uh, in, uh, in approach, it's, it's what they're trying to achieve is exactly this. A multi-signature wallet says, hey, this, wa this wallet's not, this address is not controlled by a single key. It's instead controlled by here, we'll say three keys, such that you have some policy that says there are three keys associated with this, with this address, and in order to sign, you uh, need two of these keys to sign. Any two of these things can sign. And Bitcoin actually includes this feature, as do uh, some other blockchains. So isn't this great? Why am I here? Why have I been talking about this for five years? Um, why did I write a paper on this? And the answer is, uh, no, it's not so good. It has some, it has some, uh, it has some, multi-signatures have some uh, pretty bad drawbacks. And the first one is they're inflexible. So say you're a company and you want to have some access structure on your address, say there's a manager and an employee, and I want some complex structure like the manager needs to sign off and two lower level employees need to sign off, or maybe for a certain transaction, the CEO needs to sign off, plus some higher level management, and you want to build these access structures. So first of all, it's inflexible. Any, the access structure in a multi-signature address is encoded in the address itself. So when I want to change that, I actually need to move the money to a new address in the blockchain. I need to access my money and move it. And number two is it's also bad for privacy. What what type of company wants their internal access structure of how they access their money and their, money and their approval process known to everyone in the world? And that's exactly what you have uh, with multi-signature ad uh, addresses. And actually, there are other subtle privacy, privacy problems with this as well. And the other thing is, uh, these transactions are large. So if you want to say, hey, this tr a transaction of over 10 Bitcoin requires 20 people to sign off on it, that means with multi-signatures, you have to put 20 different signatures on the blockchain. So these are all uh, drawbacks of multi-signatures and uh, things that are addressed by threshold signatures. What is a threshold signature? Well, a T of N threshold signature scheme says there are N people and we want this property that T of these or T plus one of these parties need to sign off in order to sign. But it's secure if, if, if T parties are compromised, everything's still secure. So let's put this instead of T and N, let's think about numbers. Say there are 10 people and you say, hey, any five of these people should be able to sign and, and authorize a transaction. But if four of these people get compromised or four of these people lose access to their devices, that's okay. Whoever, if you gain access to just four of these or three of these, you learn absolutely nothing. And this is a, a threshold signature. 
It's this idea that you have a threshold, and here the threshold is T. T plus one people can sign a transaction, but any less than that, learn nothing about your key. Even if you found out, hey, an attacker broke into my laptop, doesn't matter, I'll just reset it, and the attacker gains nothing, and I still have full access to, to my bitcoins or uh, other currency. So the advantages of splitting your key are the exact opposite of the ones uh, of, the, of the drawbacks of multi-signatures. And they all come from the fact that a threshold signature looks like a regular signature. Unlike a multi-signature, which is many signatures, right? You just have an address that says this, this key address requires three signatures to sign. A multi-signature does this sort of on the client side. It's a protocol among different people, but what it produces is just a single signature. And what that means is, first of all, it's private because no one knows that a threshold signature is being used here, and certainly they don't know the access policy. They don't know that this company requires three or five or six people to sign off. All they see is a regular signature, and they're none the wiser. And it's also more efficient because you can have, they can have a signature that's authorized by 100 people. But on the blockchain, all you're seeing is a single signature that looks just like any other signature. So it's both private and more efficient. And that sounds pretty good. So what is the, uh, and, and sorry, and, and uh, the, the fur furthermore, the private keys never existed, never exist in, in the threshold signature scheme. So what does that mean? It means you do a distributed key generation. You generate the key in a distributed manner such that never in time did this key ever exist on a single device. Not when you generate the key and not when you sign the key. So when you don't reconstruct the key to sign, what you do is you have a protocol among the parties that what they produce is a signature. But even if during the signing, an adversary sat, sits on T of these, of these devices, they can't learn anything, they can't forge your signatures, they can't steal your keys. Cool. So that's threshold signatures in general, but what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is threshold ECDSA. ECDSA is a very popular signature algorithm, and um, despite the fact that most of my work is in uh, building threshold ECDSA schemes, I'll give you the very honest warning that if you're a system designer, and you're trying to, you're designing a system from scratch today, you should think long and hard about what signature schemes you want to include in your, uh, in your, in your system. And ECDSA is probably, is likely not the right choice because it turns out that things that are hard like threshold signatures and ECDSA are actually much easier with other signature schemes. Uh, historically, the reason why ECDSA became popular was to avoid uh, Schnorr's patent on Schnorr's signature schemes. So there's no like good reason really um, why people, uh, you know, ECDSA doesn't have any features that are better than Schnorr, but historically that's the way things developed. And nowadays, because of backwards compatibility, right, Bitcoin uses ECDSA, Ethereum uses ECDSA, uh, there's hardware support for ECDSA, it's, it's sort of just like locked in. And often there is a good reason to use ECDSA, but if you really have a clean slate and are designing a system, there are probably better choices, so before you uh, create another backwards compatibility issue, um, you should think long and hard about that and uh, probably consult about whether uh, this is the right signature scheme for you. But anyway, let's assume that you did all that and you decided, hey, I need to go with ECDSA, so we're interested in building an ECDSA threshold signature. So what is ECDSA and why is it hard to build a threshold signature? Um, so I'm gonna show you here just the signing algorithm for ECDSA. Uh, the verification's not here, but don't worry about that. In ECDSA, you have a group G of order N, um, you have a generator G for that group, and you have a private key uh, X, which is just an element of, uh, of, the or of, of the order of the group, an element of ZN. And to generate a signature, you pick a nonce, uh, K, which is also uh, in ZN, and you compute R equals G to the K, and S is uh, K inverse M plus XR. And you see I put in red here uh, certain values, and the reason is it turns out that if you leak these values together with a signature, you just leak your whole key. Well, clearly that's true for X, because X is your key, but also true for K and K inverse. If you leak K and K inverse when you're signing, you just lose all of your security. So it turns out you have to be very careful uh, when you run these protocols to make sure that X is protected in a, in a threshold fashion, but also for each signature, this nonce K has to be protected as well. And the difficulty of ECDSA comes from the fact you see, so you have these two secrets, this K and the X, but you also need to invert K. But remember, no one knows K, so you need to invert it under multi-party computation such that no one knows it, but you still need to, they need to learn shares of its inverse, and you also need to multiply two secret shares together. And it turns out that the combination of these things makes a pretty hard technical problem. And actually, this is a problem that's not new. Uh, ECDSA, or really DSA, ECDSA is the elliptic curve variant of DSA, but it's, for all intents and purposes, it's the same problem. This has been studied for over 20 years, starting in 1996 with Rosario Gennaro uh, and some others. Um, 
they built a, an EC, a DSA threshold signature scheme, but this is in the honest majority model. And what that means is they assume that the threshold for um, the threshold um, that you're using your signers is less than half of the, to of the total available signers. So if there are 10 available signers, they said, hey, we can only support um, thresholds of one, two, three, and four. That's what their protocol supported. And this was a very popular model at the time called the honest majority model. And uh, it turned out that um, that model had some, la some deficiencies. For example, you couldn't do a two out of two signature because in a two out of two signature, you can't, uh, if you say the T has to be less than, than half of N, that means that you just can't build a two out of two signature, right? Because here N is two and T is uh, one. So T has to be less than one and you just can't build a two out of two signature. And it also, uh, it, it has other issues. It rules out some other very common use cases. So seeing that in 2004, McKenzie and Ryder built a, a, a threshold signature scheme just for the two out of two case. And then the product, the, 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 the literature on this was kind of abandoned for a while. And in 2016, uh, together with Rosario, we picked it back up and we looked at the, what's called the dishonest majority case and said, hey, let's get rid of this requirement that T has to be less than N over two. Let's pick thresholds that can be all the way up until N. That means if you have 10 players, I can say I want seven, eight, or nine, or four, or three. I can say I want any number up, up till 10 of them to be able to have the ability to sign up on transactions. And that was our paper in 2016, um, but that had some problems, in particular the uh, distributed key generation was very inefficient. Uh, in 2017, Lindell had a paper on uh, the two out of two case in which they made it much more efficient than McKenzie and Ryder's, and Ryder's um, uh, 2004 scheme, but again, it was still limited to two out of two signers, again, limited to the case where two people are signing, it doesn't work for general three, four, five, six people signing. Uh, in 2018, uh, there was a resurgence of research here together with, um, I had a paper with Rosario, a very similar paper by Lindahl and Oaf, and um, uh, another paper out of Abhi Shalat's group, um, uh, they, which were much more efficient schemes for the general multi-party case that um, had T is less than or T is less than or equal to N, you can have, and, and very efficient, and very efficient distributed key generation as well. And that's sort of uh, the talk that I gave last year here. I presented at, at CESC last year our, our protocol, um, our 2018 CCS paper, and I said, hey, until now, you couldn't really do threshold signatures efficiently um, because the distributed key generation was problematic. We solved it, everything's done, it's great, start using this, build this in your application. And that was sort of my talk here last year. And it turns out that it was somewhat successful um, because um, over the past year, I've become aware of many, many companies that are actually integrating uh, threshold signatures or ECDSA threshold signatures into their technologies. And uh, some of these, uh, most of these I'm not involved with at all. I just find out about them, like, of course, on Twitter, like everything else. And, um, but you have big companies here, like Binance, that are using it. You have companies that are service providers that are, are, that are giving this uh, threshold signature technology to exchange, like Unbound Tech, you have protocols like uh, off-chain labs, arbitrary by off-chain labs, and uh, Keep Network that are using threshold signatures to bring parties together to do things in distributed protocols. So you really have uh, the gamut of the design space here. People are starting to see the power of this technology and saying, hey, in 2018, we really, we really got this stuff to work. Uh, it's efficient, it works fast, signing takes you know, a matter of uh, tens of milliseconds, uh, key generation is also, everything is like super fast, so uh, great. Um, let's, uh, people are actually starting to use this. So that was my talk last year, and so that's it, right? So we solved it, people use it, I should pat myself on the back, and uh, we're done. So what is, uh, why am I here? Um, and that's a good question, and I hope I have an answer because I still have 16 more minutes. And the good thing is I do. Uh, so let's take another look at the protocol. So here's how the protocol works at a very high level. So here you have Alice, Bob, and Charlie want to sign a message. So think of this as a three of N protocol. Maybe there are 20 players, maybe there are 10, but this is a protocol that says in order to sign, you need three, three of the players to participate and sign. So Alice, Bob, and Charlie say, hey, we like this message, we're gonna sign it. So how does the protocol work at a very high level? These protocol are, protocols are interactive. All the protocols, uh, mine and Rosario's, Lindell's, um, Abhi Shalats, they're all uh, interactive protocols that proceed in many rounds. And the way they basically go is, in round one, everybody sends messages, everyone communicates and sends messages to each other, and then everyone waits for those messages, and then they proceed to round two, and you continue this on for many rounds. I believe our protocol has nine rounds. So and the idea is you, you keep, keep on doing this. And at the end, after those rounds, after everyone keeps sending messages, at the end, poof, you have a signature. 
Uh, but the thing is, it's not a guarantee they'll always get a signature. Sometimes the protocol will abort without a signature. And why does that happen? Well, it's sort of fundamental. Remember this idea that I mentioned that uh, we want the dishonest majority, we want T to be up to N. Remember, T is the number of players in the system that can be compromised. You say, hey, as long as if only T devices are lost, if the adversary steals T devices, if T devices fall in the puddle, everything's good. Well, if you want T to be up to N, you have an issue here because on the one hand, there can, there, there can be up to T bad players. Right? T players can just not want to sign, do the wrong thing. On the other hand, I need T plus one to sign. But for certain values, if T is all the way up into N, if there are T bad guys, I might not have T plus one left to actually sign. So as a simple example, think of the two out of two case. Right? In the two out of two case, we could tolerate one person who's bad. Right? If, 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 if I lose my one computer, or one computer falls in a puddle, one guy is just uh, publishes a share, it's okay. Everything's still, everything's still good. But if that guy's bad and there are only two people, then I'm not going to be able to get a signature, right? So the idea is in these protocols, we guarantee you security. So uh, if one guy loses his, his, computer, his share or someone uh, drops her phone in, uh, in, in the lake, everything's fine. You won't lose security. Your key is, uh, is secure. But unless everyone participates, you can't guarantee that you'll get a signature. Um, so what is the room for improvement in this protocol, seeing that number one is there's lots of interaction in this protocol. Remember I showed you there was these nine rounds of interaction where everyone has to go back and forth and talk to each other. And the idea is this is problematic for two reasons. First of all, it just takes a while to coordinate because everyone needs to, you, I can't go ahead and do my, if it was just me sending nine messages, that would be fine, but I have to wait for everyone else and then I have to wait for everyone else. So it's nine rounds of interaction where everyone has to sort of wait for everyone else. Now with two or three people, maybe this is okay, but when you have like 20 people and you have to coordinate coordinate this over a laggy network, um, A, it takes a lot of time, but also it means that you need everyone to be on time, uh, online simultaneously. So if Alice says, hey, I want to sign this message, and Bob says, hey, I want to sign this message, and Charlie says, I want to sign the message, they actually, not only do they need to like, look at the message and say that, they need to find the time where they're all going to be online at the same time so they can engage in this protocol. Uh, so that turns out to be a problem. And also, the protocol is vulnerable to a denial of service attack, and let me show you why. So remember, this is like round nine. Everyone sends these messages. And we said that uh, it could happen that the protocol aborts without a signature. So why does the protocol abort? It aborts if someone does the wrong thing. Someone doesn't send the message they're supposed to send. So here, Charlie decides, hey, I'm not going to send the message I was supposed to send. I'm going to send this other message, which is malicious. And uh, Alice, it turns out, is no, none the wiser. Alice can't tell if this is the right message or the wrong message. She, all that she knows is she accepts Charlie's message. And then poof, they try to get the signature and say, oh, something went wrong. The signature didn't work. But no one here knows why it didn't work in the current protocols. You can't say, hey, Charlie sent the wrong message, right? Alice says, hey, who's responsible? Why didn't we get a signature? So Bob says, not I, but can we fix it? And Charlie says, no, we can't. Uh, it wasn't me either, right? So nobody knows uh, who, who would it. Charlie knows that he did the wrong thing, but the idea is that no one can prove that. There's th this protocol doesn't have an identifiable abort. You can't attribute and say, hey, this is the misbehaving party. And this turns out to be a problem because Charlie can just deny service to the protocol by putting a big smile on his face and saying, hey, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. And then the protocol fails and no one knows um, why it failed. And maybe, you, you know, his, the three of them, they can get into a room and figure it out. But like there are 20 people and one guy decides he just wants to be annoying. So everyone's trying to sign, doing the right thing. But one person is just holding up the protocol by sending the wrong messages. And in the current protocol, it's not possible to know uh, always who the, the bad person was. So we have a new paper, and this is the uh, main result that I'm announcing today, which is threshold ECDSA with identifiable abort and one online round. And what does that mean exactly? Well, uh, it means, first of all, you can do identifiable aborts. So if Charlie sends the wrong message, Alice uh, says, hey, I can go ahead and look at the protocol transcript, and you know, we, we, we modify the protocol slightly. I can go ahead and look at the protocol and say, hey, Charlie's responsible. And Bob's disappointed, and Charlie's really sad because everyone caught him. And um, of course, by the way, it, when it comes to incentives, you know, the it happens to be our protocol is very, very efficient, but you, you don't even need it to be efficient in some sense because the mechanism of knowing that, hey, if I cheat, they will catch me is often enough, right? If there's no mechanism, then you can cheat. But once that mechanism exists, the incentive to cheat uh, generally goes away. But it happens to be our protocol is super efficient. Uh, we have two approaches to, to identifiable aborts. One is a little bit more uh, expensive and uses uh, some more expensive zero-knowledge proofs. But then we, we looked in, into our old, uh, our old protocol and we found out that there's actually a trick we can use. 
Uh, it turns out, by the way, that um, identifying aborts is a problem you want in general MPC, general multi-party computation, but in, an apps, in a general sense, when you don't have knowledge of the specific function you're using for just for general MPC, it's actually a, a pretty hard problem, and the construction zone are all very, very expensive. But what we realized is that for specifically for a signature scheme, um, it's actually it can be done quite efficiently. And the intuition, if you're curious, um, is um, so remember in, in ECDSA, the issue is once you release S, the signature, you can't release K. But it turns out, in our protocol, we know if, if the signature will fail before you actually even release S. And at that point, it's safe to release K. So if you detect that the signature will fail, you say to everyone else, hey, show me that you did the right thing. And at that point, you can sort of just open everything up in the clear, and you don't even need expensive zero-knowledge proofs. So it turns out that it's, it's a highly uh, efficient protocol um, that we can now identify aborts. And as we'll see in a minute, this is actually pretty important for, for a bunch of applications. And the other thing that our, we do in our new paper is we have asynchronous approval, which means uh, just one, Alice, Bob, and Charlie don't all need to be online at the same time. And the way it works is at the beginning of time when they set up their system and they decide, hey, we're setting up a signature scheme, we're generating, and when they do the distributed key generation, they generate some information, some general information, they pre-process information for a bunch of signatures. And maybe they'll do this for a thousand signatures. And when it comes now, they don't know the messages yet. They're just, right, this has nothing to do with the messages, but now when it comes to them um, signing something, they no longer need to interact because all that's left, the only thing that depends on the message that they're signing is just one round. And uh, there's now, so, so now there's no need for them to be online simultaneously because Alice sees the message, says, hey, yeah, I want to sign that. I notice Bob's not online, Charlie's not online. All Alice needs to send out on, in the online phase is a single message. And then she goes offline, Bob comes online and says, hey, I'm signing it too. And he goes offline, and then Charlie cuts, comes online, and all they need to send is, new, is, is one message each, with, and they, then they get the signature. So this is a, in terms of, um, first of all, it's faster because you don't have to do all this offline, uh, you don't have to do all these, uh, all these rounds online, but more importantly, um, you can, uh, you, you can, you can, you, they, they can do this and not have to find a time where they're all online. They can do this asynchronously, which is really, really important. So uh, let's look briefly in the few minutes we have left at some applications um, where this matters. Um, so number one application where people are using threshold signatures is for cost key custody solutions, where you're uh, either splitting up your keys on your own device or you're asking maybe uh, in a company, you're giving each uh, employee a key share and that's how you're storing the company wallet. Or maybe you're a service provider who's offloading uh, key storage for a company and the idea is, um, if you were just a bunch of computers that were staying online and you're separating your keys and a bunch of computers, and the idea is these computers always just approve the transactions, but the benefit is an attacker has to attack them all to learn the key, so then maybe it's not the biggest deal if they have to be online because these servers are always online. But often you'll want a human in the loop, right? In a company, you don't just want to split your key among computers that are just going to approve anything. You actually want a human in the loop that says, hey, do I want to spend this money? Is this a legitimate transaction? And that's when the online problem becomes really, really uh, problematic when you're dealing with humans because Alice just uh, is in the airport waiting to catch her flight and Bob's uh, in an Uber but he doesn't have, uh, he's in a tunnel so he doesn't actually have a connectivity and the idea is that you know they're going to all be able to look at it in the next 10 minutes and say hey I approve this transaction but they're not going to find a time where they're all simultaneously online. So it turns out that if humans are in the loop, the problem of asynchronous signing is really, really important. And also, if humans are in the loop, um, you know, if I was just if I was at a company just controlling a bunch of servers, then the problem of identifiable aborts might not be the biggest issue. If one of them does the wrong thing, I just reset all my servers. But if you have humans with different incentives here that can try to deny service, then the problem of identifying aborts is also becomes uh, pretty important. Um, Another uh, place where threshold signatures are used are multi-party protocols, where you have a bunch of parties that need to, that need to generate a signature. And the idea is, um, why do you would use threshold signatures here? First of all, it's private. Maybe you don't want to know the exact, you don't want to leak the exact set of signers that, that participated in the protocol always. You just, to the world, you just want to release a signature to the world and said, hey, we had a quorum, we had a threshold, and it was signed. But also, it's, as we mentioned before, efficient, because instead of having N signatures from each party, you just have a single signature that's it. A single signature that's just the size of one signature and you don't bloat the blockchain. But the problem is that, uh, again, when you have multi -party, multiple parties coordinating in a protocol, the inability to, ident to identify cheaters becomes actually pretty problematic. One person does the wrong thing, they dot the entire protocol. Uh, this comes out in like state channels, for example, or Arbitrum, where you have uh, 
Uh, you need uh, unanimous people si signing off, and, and, and sign unanimous, unanimous signatures. Everyone needs to sign off to a state update. And the thing is, uh, that means for every state update, you have n signatures. It would be much more efficient if you can get a single uh, signature. But again, if we're using the previous protocols, there's a DOS attack here that's uh, very cheap and can really uh, cut catastrophic. So something I'm really excited about. And uh, another protocol, so uh, a, a class of protocols that people are using, this is sort of a very simple um, uh, protocol, but you should look at what like, uh, the people at Keep Network are doing with their TBDC, which uh, has the flavor of this. And the idea is that you have some funds on uh, blockchain A, and you have a committee that escrows those funds and locks them up. <laughs> and then you have, um, under certain conditions, if something happens maybe on blockchain B, the committee is supposed to go ahead and uh, sign a transaction to release those funds. And the idea is you want the committee to be incentivized to sign and you can have a smart contract manager to say, hey, committee, if you fail to produce this signature, you're going to get punished, you're going to get slashed. Well, it turns out in the previous protocols, in our previous protocol and all the others, you, you couldn't guarantee this because uh, it turns out if one person decides not to sign, they can do it in a way that you have no idea who they are. So there's, in the, at the level of the individual signer, you can deny service to the protocol, but the point is that a smart contract can't look at the evidence and punish you and slash you because maybe it will slash the wrong person, right? It doesn't know if Alice, Bob, or Charlie were, were misbehaving, so how can it punish anyone? But now that you can identify uh, the aborts, uh, you can actually have a smart contract that fully manages uh, the decentralized protocol and can uh, punish people if they do the wrong thing. Uh, so just uh, conclusions. Um, so last year I came here and I said fast, tr trustless, threshold BCD is now possible, but the addition of now is we also do attributable. So we fully know when someone misbehaves, who's misbehaving, we can do this extremely efficiently, and we can uh, punish them for that. We can do asynchronous signing and asynchronous approvals. So there's only a single round online that depends on the message. So the parties go ahead and pre-compute things. When it comes to signing, they can do this asynchronously. Everyone sends a single message when they have time. They don't need to wait for other people to be online. As soon as you have enough people that sent that message, poof, you get a signature and there's no multiple rounds of interaction. Um, there are multiple uh, efforts to open source uh, implementations. Personally, I'll be involved in one uh, coming from off-chain labs. And if you want to be involved in uh, the open source pr uh, process, uh, come find me or reach out to me. Um, we'll be happy to have uh, as many people involved as possible. And uh, the last thing is, um, you know, I find that when I came here last year, actually this is true for all the papers. In 1996, uh, when Gennaro wrote his paper, they, they thought the problem was done, right? We solved uh, threshold uh, DSA, and it turns out that uh, 15, 20 years later, people were interested in a different model, in a model of um, dishonest majority. And this repeats itself over and over. And when I came here last year, I really thought that this line of research was done. But then actually from hearing from people that are actually using this, I sort of understood how important it is to have asynchronous signing. And this problem of identifiable aborts becomes a real problem in protocols. So the key takeaway here is uh, go ahead and build things with this and try to use it. And if you run into issues and say, hey, there's a problem here where we need this feature. Uh, let me know because it gives me cool things to work on and hopefully it will be helpful for you as well. Uh, thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to take questions in the remaining uh, two minutes. <laughs> uh, so where can we find the paper? Uh, I will post the paper. Um, the paper will be on ePrint within the next few days. Unfortunately, it didn't go up yet, but um, it will be on uh, ePrint, and I will also post it on my website and uh, tweet about it. So I know you're more on the sort of research side, but on the application side, what do you think is, uh, TSS uh, opens up in terms of usability, and specifically, what does TSS mean to the whole um, hardware wallet industry? that has been sort of like the preferred way to, for one to store current, cryptocurrency in the last five, 10 years? Uh, so in terms of, uh, was the second question a, a law question? Is that I, I, what was the second one? I missed the. No, uh, so in, in, terms of, um, in terms of security, mm -hmm. what do the advances in, in TSS mean for hardware wallets that have been sort of like the oh, secure and sort of. Okay. Yeah. best practice for storing crypto. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, in terms of security, I think this is, and usability, I think this is a really big step forward um, because, again, 
uh, I, I personally like I hold bitcoins and I would never ever ever like hold it on a you know I, I hold it on a key on, on a server I prefer actually to offload my storage because even with, with the things I create this, this is a hard problem so as this becomes more usable and companies are actually implementing these things and putting this in the hand of users I think usability will go up giving people access to actually store to have custody of their own coins but and not be afraid that they'll lose them uh, is is huge and it's super important because if you don't have that we're just going to move back towards centralization right if you actually want decentralization you need you need to have this and uh, the resilience to I can lose a device I can, I can drop my phone my computer my hard drive can fail but I can still recover is is super important in terms of hard drive uh, hardware wallets I think that um, these two things work really, really nicely together. Um, what I'd like to see is, and uh, I've, I, I've heard some rumblings about it, but what I'd love to see is hardware wallets that support threshold signing. So when you have your ledger or whatever, and your ledger doesn't actually store your key, it stores a share of your key, and it will engage, engage in this protocol. And similarly, um, this, this, this plays really nicely with, with um, with um, paper wallets and off-chain wallets as well. You can take a key chair, a key, uh, uh, um, you can take a sh one share of your key and print it up on a paper or, or put it in a hardware wallet, whatever you want, and put it completely offline in a safe. And that's sort of your offline backup key, uh, backup share, but you still have this property. If someone gets into your safe somehow, they, they, can't, they can't steal your Bitcoin. So it actually, I think, improves physical security, usability, and also um, I think there's a really good space for integration with hardware wallets, and I'd like, love to see that happen. Thank you.